Okay, so today we're going to look at the question of corporal punishment as part of um, a ongoing focus on the use of violence against children. And one of the reasons we're focusing on corporal punishment is precisely because it's one of those very, very controversial areas. Um, and some of the questions that we've raised before, there have really been themes in our discussions, the questions of what things are even called violence? What are regarded, what, what kind of acts are classified as violence and which ones aren't? And then within that, who's allowed to use violence? And who are they allowed to use it against? And on what occasions are they allowed to use it? And remember, this had come up before when we were talking about um, police use of violence in certain contexts. Um, and so, so all of these questions are occurring. So, so what do we call violent? Who's allowed to use what kinds of force? When, with what justification, against which victims? Um, and one of the, the, the things we need to look at more closely is how, how are these ideas influenced? Like, where do they come from? Because it seems there's two, di two t totally different kind of traditions of influence. The one is, 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 is kind of culture. People just acquiring ideas from their parents, from their, from their community, from their religion. And the other is ideas that are developed and tested by science. And this goes right back to our distinction between ideas about violence that are conscious, and so we can ask questions about them versus ideas about violence which are not conscious, and so we can't check whether they're true or not. Um, this then leads us into a number of other issues. If we have in the same society people who strongly disagree on the same issue, disagree about whether it's acceptable, whether it should be classified as violence or not, whether it should be criminalized or not, how do we negotiate those disagreements? Um, how, how, how do people holding the different sides of the arguments um, work with each other? Uh, which is really a question of how do we produce social change? Um, and that becomes a really interesting question here um, because th this is a particular area where there's consensus amongst the, the, the professional experts and scientific researchers um, and there's not consensus amongst um, many of the other cultural groups in society. Um, so, so what do we do about that? And particularly, there's this growing question of what do we do when the people who work in the field know what needs to be done to fix something? When, when they've done the research, they've done the professional practice, but the public and the, um, don't agree with them and the politicians um, out of their, their interest in re-election rather than other social goods, tend to want to follow um, public opinion or at least the vocal elements, which are often the extremist elements of public opinion, rather than the science and expertise in the matter. So all of these are really relevant background issues. Before we even start talking about um, corporal punishment itself, we need to, I, I want to contextualize it in, in terms of these thematic questions which have been guiding us through the course. But let's talk about corporal punishment properly then. Um, so uh, there's a, the, 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 a, a definition given in one of your readings. Corporal punishment is defined as the use of physical force towards a child for the purpose of control and correction. It is a disciplinary technique applied to the body with the intention of causing some degree of pain or discomfort, however light. Okay. Now, that's one definition of corporal punishment. Um, it is possible to define it differently. For instance, literally the word corporal just means the word bodily, okay? Bodily punishment is any punishment that is inflicted on the body as such. So, um, you know, use of some kind of force against the body. It doesn't have to be against children. There are many countries where corporal punishment is is a is a legal legal punishment that is that the um that the courts actually um, give as sentences. For instance, someone may be sentenced to be to be um, beaten with a whip. Um, and um, so and it, it does it, corporal punishment doesn't only refer to children, but in the context of our discussion now it's going to it's going to have that conventional sense of being used to refer to children. And it also can be anything physical against the body. 
Um, and so generally we are understanding for our discussion today that it's about children and it's also about painful physical interventions. And it includes a lot of things. The most obvious one is hitting in various ways, but also shaking, biting, forcing um, people into uncomfortable positions like long periods of kneeling or being locked in a, in a, in a, in a closed space that is uncomfortable. Um, so all of those can broadly refer to anything that hurts the body. Um, so a number of questions we want to ask. Who is allowed to hit children? Uh, and in different contexts, the question could, could it be uh, parents? Could it be teachers? Could it be all adults? Could it be representatives of the law? Um, could it be community leaders? Um, and, 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 the, and, the, and the most difficult of all questions, what is the boundary between two different concepts, one being corporal punishment and the other being abuse? And really, this is at the heart of our discussion now, is, is, is our understanding of what corporal punishment is, is really connected to our understanding of what abuse is. Um, and whether abuse and corporal punishment are the same thing or whether they overlap or whether they're totally different things. Um, but essentially it comes down to the question of where, how, and under what circumstances can children be hit? And this is actually an extraordinary question because it's not a question we ask in other places. We don't ask like the question of, well, and under what circumstances is your intimate partner allowed to hit you? Um, we don't ask the question of under, under what circumstances are you allowed to hit another adult who's being rude to you or who's pushed in front of you in a queue or taken your parking spot um, or even who's stolen something from you. I mean, there's just, there's, we just don't, we don't really have those kind of provisions for, for adults hitting each other. Um, and I mean, it's even stranger than that. I mean, for, if, for instance, if a child grows up is an adult and hits their their elderly parents for exactly the same kind of behavior that their parents hit them for when they were a child, that would immediately be a criminal offense and the police could be called. So it's, it's quite extraordinary that we have this provision for hitting children that, that we just don't have for other kinds of assault. And it's even stranger when you think about it because we accept that children are the most vulnerable members of society. We, we accept that child abuse is one of the worst possible things and that children should be protected even more than adults. How is it then that we have this provision for hitting them? Um, and it's actually a very, very strange state of affairs. And, and, and it, it, should, it should strike us as, as being really unusual um, and yet, for the most part, it's completely normalized, although, as this whole discussion indicates, it's, it's highly contested. Okay. Now, traditionally within the legal framework, and this is inherited from, kind of the, um, from the British legal system dating back to the 1860s, um, the notion of a reasonable chastisement okay, is, is offered as a legal defense. And in fact, this is, a, this is based on a notion out of the Christian Bible um, that, that in, 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 in certain verses justifies the use of violence um, against children. I mean, it, the, the Christian Bible justifies lots of kinds of violence. It justifies, um, uh, essentially justifies genocide, slavery, violence against women, violence against children. But strange enough, the, it's the violence of children that has, is, is the one that is still defended by many religious fundamentalists who've, who've, who've agreed that they've had to let go of all the other ones. Um, Okay, so reasonable chastisement, okay, that, that, that the, the punishment should be neither unreasonable nor excessive. But of course, to, to put the word reasonable in front of chastisement, chastisement simply means punishment, right? To put the word reasonable in front doesn't do anything because precisely the question is what is reasonable. So to saying it should be reasonable doesn't give us any guideline at all because it doesn't guide us into saying, well, what should be thought of as being reasonable? And this is exactly where the disagreement arises, that some people think some things are reasonable and other th people think those things are unreasonable. So the law, in, in, in using a term like that, is, is utterly failing in its responsibility to, to provide a coherent guideline. 
Um, now, when we look at it, what, one of the interesting things is, is how um, differing and changing the legal frameworks are. Um, and between different countries in the world, there are massive differences around corporal punishment. I mean, far less so than around, you know, things like homicide and theft. And uh, there, there are relatively high degrees of consistency across those. Even one of the more controversial areas like sexual violence, there's, there's far higher degrees of consistency than around corporal punishment. Um, it's not only that different countries differ, even different states within Australia differ. And there's, there's no consistent f uh, f sort of federal legislation that, that unifies them. Um, and it's not only that, but, but there have been huge changes over time. So this is where one of the areas where both public opinion and the law have changed very significantly over the past two generations. Um, and so, it's, it, if anything, the area of corporal punishment is defined, defined by legal inconsistency um, and, 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 and uh, rapid change. Why is it then that this is such an emotional and contested topic, even though the research is not contested? This is, this is an extremely well-researched topic for at least 50 years now. Um, there's literally thousands of studies from around the world, and they produce really quite consistent um, findings about the uh, different aspects of the harmfulness of corporal punishment. Okay? When we go back and look at the National Commission of Violence that it has been so influential um, in the last few decades of, of Australian um, law and understanding of violence, um, we see that they were very clear in their opposition to corporal punishment. But as soon as they, and it was one of the things they, that was part of the, how they defined their mandate to look, at, to look at violence broadly and violence against children as a key issue and corporal punishment as an issue of violence against children. Um, but they were, they were immediately um, uh, faced with the problem of of the press opposition and the kind of tabloid press started doing the usual thing of, of kind of making these sensationalized headlines of, you know, like parents won't be allowed to discipline their children and children will just run wild and the society will become criminal. It's a very kind of popular conservative position. Um, and um, not only that, but even then on the issue of corporal punishment in schools, one of the things they, they said is, well, if the issue of the home is too controversial, we can at least advise that corporal punishment in schools should be prohibited. And this, you know, remember, is going back to the 1990s. Um, and they couldn't even get that through. And they were politically advised that if they continued with their you know, following the expertise and research on, 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 on offering strong guidelines against corporal punishment, that it would undermine all the other work. It would, it, would, it would trigger such strong public and political opposition that the whole, that all of the work of the commission would just become discarded. Um, which is kind of pretty much what happened anyway, if you remember, like even, even the gun laws, uh, even the gun law proposals weren't accepted until after you know, the, um, the massacre that eventually triggered the public response. So one of the other things they talked about is that, that, it, they, that there is a real need for, for public and parental education. Um, firstly, around understanding the harms of corporal banishment. Secondly, around understanding the, 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 um, the kind of logic of alternatives to uh, corporal punishment and the and the alternative disciplinary practices, and then also, you know, winning support for these um, guidelines of, of of preventing these forms of violence against children, um, and and why they are necessary. And what we what we can see is that already since then, since since the struggle in the 1990s. Massive changes have happened, and massive changes in public attitudes have happened since then. Um, and yet we still don't see a, um, legal guidelines that are being informed by what is known um, in the research field. So what, what, what do we see globally? Um, 
in some countries, particularly European countries, um, corporal punishment has been illegal for 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 at least two generations. Already, Switzerland, going, uh, Sweden, going back to the nineteen seventies, uh, um, led the um, the prohibition of corporal punishment. Um, interestingly, these are societies which we now see have very very low forms of of violence, and we can't help but ask what the correlation is there. Um, more recently, countries like New Zealand in 2007 uh, abolished corporal punishment, but Australia, despite being a leader in certain other human rights areas, has, has failed uh, to, to follow on and join the kind of international community, or even to, to follow the, the recommendations of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child um, in opposing corporal punishment. So globally, about half of the countries in the world um, have either already um, uh, pro prohibit, prohibited corporal punishment, about a, a quarter of the total in the world. There's another quarter that have committed to, to the fact that they're going to and they're attempting to change their laws and social practices uh, in that direction. But the other half have made no such um, commitment. Um, and in Australia, not only ha has it not followed the National Commission on Violence or the United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, but there's a total failure to, to, to develop a kind of consistency, a kind of federal consistency. And so, so different states have different legislations um, around corporal punishment in the home, corporal punishment in school, um, but mostly they're still guided by this um, 150-year-old British legal uh, idea of, of reasonable chastisement, um, that, that, that parents can hit their children if it constitutes, uh, according to some totally undefined um, set of principles, reasonable punishment. Um, so if that's the state of kind of, of, of the law and public opinion, what is the state of the research? Well, there's, there's a lot of research, um, but a, a number of findings can be drawn out there. Um, and those are, are, are listed on the research findings slide. Firstly, it is known to have a negative uh, impact on child-parent relationships. It, it, uh, it, it impacts negatively. It, it, it makes it more difficult for children to to feel trust and safety and affection in parent-child relationships. It increases feelings of, of hostility um, and anger, and, and so it generally impacts poorly on that relationship. The other thing, and this is one of the big worries that people who work in this area have, is it increases the risk of, of physical abuse. That if you say that some physical violence is okay, um, you know, low levels, you know, hitting on the buttocks with the open hand, that increases the chance that in more stressful situations, more violence will be used. So if you normalize a, a bit of violence, it, it significantly increases the chances that in, then in, in, in more extreme situations, more violence can, will be used. And in some cases, very much more, um, where the, the violence causes very serious harm or even death. Um, but this is, this is interesting. Not only is, is, is it known to impact negatively on the, on the, on the, on the relationship uh, to increase the risk of physical abuse, but it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. I mean, the reason parents hit their children is to increase obedience and compliance, is to make them do what they want them to do. And this is really interesting. Um, it, corporal punishment doesn't do that. It does do something. And the, and, 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 and the reason I find this so interesting is because this is often what violence does. It produces a rapid reaction. Okay, one of, the, one of the advantages of violence is it gets people to change what they're doing very quickly. Uh, if a child is, you know, being annoying and you hit them, they will often very rapidly stop being annoying. If someone... If you want someone to give you their money very quickly and they don't want to, then all you do is point a gun at them and they very rapidly hand their money over to you. It causes 
causes quick and effective short-term changes. The problem is that it causes long-term negative changes. So although sometimes corporal punishment in the moment has the desired effect, it doesn't over time. So it doesn't overall, if you hit kids, it doesn't <coughs> overall make them more obedient. In fact, it makes them overall more disobedient. It makes them more antisocial, more inclined to delinquency, more inclined to defiance. So the short-term gain leads to a long-term loss. And this is one of the very, very important things that we know about corporal punishment and most other forms of physical threat is, is that they can, they're, they're, what, whatever gains they produce in the short term, they, they lose more than that gain in the long term. Okay, so what are those long-term losses? Well, it, it produces increases in overall antisocial behavior and, uh, and behavioral problems. That kids who are beaten in the home tend to be more defiant, more antisocial, more inclined to law-breaking um, external acts of violence than those who are not. Um, so it actually increases the overall level of aggressive and antisocial behavior in children especially as they grow up. The other thing it uh, produces is what, what they call low moral internalization. Okay, now what do we mean by moral internalization? Essentially, there's two reasons people don't do bad things. The one is because they're scared of getting caught and punished, and the other is because they think it's wrong, because inside, inside them, they feel it's wrong. So, so a person would be like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to rape people um, because I'm scared of going to jail if I do versus I'm not going to rape people because that's a, that's a disgusting thing to do. Like that's just sick and you, and no one should do that. Now, stopping people doing something because they're scared of getting caught only works if they really are scared of getting caught. And if there really is a chance of them getting caught, the problem with that, the problem with external motivations is as soon as a person can see, well, but look, this person's alone by themselves. It's dark. No one will recognize me. I'll never get caught. That There's no reason not to do that. There's no reason not to sexually assault them or stab them or beat them or whatever it is you want to do. So internalized moral behavior is much better for society than simple fear of punishment. And that's a real problem because pretty much our criminal justice system is based on the idea of of, 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 of external punishment, not of moral internalization. And that's a huge, huge issue. So the problem with corporal punishment is it leads to low moral internalization. Children, instead of thinking, oh, I don't want to do this because it hurts someone. Oh, I don't want to do that because I understand that it, it, it actually causes problems. It makes my parents stressed. It makes other people unhappy. It makes them scared about my safety. They simply get into the mindset, well, I better not do that because I'll be hurt if I do it. But then as soon as they won't be hurt, as soon as they are become the stronger one, as soon as they're stronger than the other people around them, or they get a weapon that gives them a, an advantage of the other people around them, then the reason not to do that stuff just evaporates. So the, 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 the low moral internalization is a huge issue that we should worry about. Um, and, and, and we need to think about that, the way in which these like threats and pain um, simply produce fear of punishment. And fear of punishment is, is a very, very bad way of regulating social behavior uh, for all of these reasons. Of course, the other big thing that goes wrong is it leads to psychological problems in the developing child. It leads firstly to low self-esteem and, and all the problems that go with that and a, and a range of mental health problems. So depression, anxiety, lack of trust in other people. But most of all, and we're going to talk about this more later, is a, a lack of empathy. If, if your main relation to people is that you fear being hurt by them, that is very, very poor conditions for developing the kind of empathy where your relation to people is, is, is really structured by, by caring about them and, and, and worrying and being concerned about their feelings. Um, so if we, if, 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 if we create this negative uh, um, self-esteem, 
if we undermine the capacity for forming uh, empathy, if, if we create mental health problems, we, we're actually creating a pathway for more antisocial behavior and more violence rather than, than less. Um, and of course, overall, what we find in the research is that, that corporal punishment really has the same kinds of negative consequences as physical abuse. Um, perhaps to a different degree in different ways. Um, and one of the things is the way in which it perpetuates a cycle, that those who have been victims of corporal punishment tend to be those who feel most justified in using it. This is not always true, and often people who've been harmed by corporal punishment actually become those who advocate against it, but often it leads to a kind of normalization. Um, so, um, so the research findings are clear. The research findings are clear that corporal punishment is overall just a really terrible idea for a, a number of different reasons. Um, so why is it controversial then? Well, interestingly enough, at this point, we've got to stop and say, what do we even mean by corporal punishment? To say corporal punishment, well, what does that mean? Um, uh, using force against children, uh, the, the infliction of pain on their bodies to regulate their behavior. Yes, but, but does it, is, it, is it about um, beating your children with a belt? Um, is it uh, you know, about holding their hand onto a hot stove? Um, is it about giving them a, a slap on the back of their hand with your fingers? Um, is it about giving them a light slap on the buttocks with an open hand? What, what are we calling corporal punishment? Are all these the same thing? Uh, and the context is really crucial, is, is very, very occasional light corporal punishment in the context of, a, of an open, communicative, caring relationship, the same as um, erratic physical punishments in the context of what is really a, a pattern of overall neglect. Um, so it's not just the question, it's, corporal punishment is not one thing. Firstly, it's not just one, kind, one collection of acts. It depends on, on, the, on the context, on the meaning, of the, on the frequency of the relationship in which they occur, the communication in which they occur, all of those things. So it really, this is, a, this is a, in fact, an overly broad term that we need to specify in much more detail. And so the Hazel study done in 2002 in the UK that, that, that said, well, wait a minute, let's just not, let's forget about trying to just say, like, does corporal punishment cause effect X? And say, well, let, let's actually get at what people think about, like, what are they, what are they thinking about the specifics of corporal punishment? Um, and we already know that, that the attitudes do, differ really widely ac across culture, religion, age, nationality, um, but this just based in the UK. Um, asked, asked, asked people like, well, well, what is okay and what is not okay? Where, what, 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 where do you draw the line between, you know, what you might classify as reasonable chastisement and what you might classify, classify as abuse? And it was quite interesting what they found and was specific to that society and certainly not universal. Firstly, they found that, that hitting on the, on the buttocks and the arms and the legs was generally seen as okay. About half of all the people surveyed thought that, you know, that those were the places you, you can hit, as opposed to hitting on the head is, is, is really not okay and you shouldn't do that. Um, the specific questions, like if, you, if, if, if a hit leaves a red mark, is that okay? Uh, or if it leaves, it leaves a bruise or a cut, is that okay? And it turns out very few people, 8% thought leaving a red mark was okay, but just about no one thought leaving a bruise or a cut was okay. And that's interesting and also specific. There, there's certainly many places in which, which um, uh, leaving a red mark would be normal and a, and a bit of bruising might be seen as acceptable. Um, a couple of things were specifically excluded. Uh, one of them was shaking. And one of the reasons why shaking children uh, was, was seen as not acceptable because the, in that um, society, a lot of education had been done about the high risks of harm to children and, and the way in which shaking can, can specifically cause brain damage. Um, so people had kind of responded to public education and were like, no, nope, shaking is not okay. 
um, but also hitting with hard objects. Um, that that you know, and only two or three percent of people supported um, uh, shaking and hitting with hard objects. But once again, what hard objects? Uh, it used to be that hitting with a bamboo cane was a totally normal um, uh, punishment. That in fact was a kind of preferred, seen as a responsible punishment. Say as opposed to hitting with a baseball bat. Um, so what hard objects are we talking about here? Um, but generally, you no know, shaking, hitting with objects in this study was seen as, as unacceptable by an overwhelming majority of people. The other thing that was found is the reasons for the corporal punishment um, differed uh, in, in terms of their support. So if the child was in immediate danger, then doing something to stop it, uh, to, to really protect the child against, against danger, what was, was very widely supported. But simply hitting the child to exert authority, to express frustration, th those weren't widely supported. Um, and interestingly, that's a cultural change. It used to be that the big argument for hitting children was that you, you needed to establish your authority over them. Apparently, that is no longer a widely held belief in, in that society. So it, so it becomes interesting to unpack the specificity and that it's not as simple as saying, oh, majority of people do or don't believe in corporal punishment. Well, they believe in certain things and not other things. So perhaps the question is less a question of, you know, should corporal punishment be prohibited as much as what, what guidelines and where should the restrictions be? The, the, what, what meaning should the this legal term uh, reasonable chastisement, what, what specific legal... Uh, meanings should be attached to it that, that people could agree on um, as social guidelines. And it really comes down to a, a, a kind of set of popular beliefs, changing and contested beliefs, um, about the difference between hurt and harm. Because those who believe in corporal punishment certainly believe that it's okay to hurt children, which you know, just stop right there. That's a really strange belief, okay? But, but I mean, that's the point. That's why you hit children in order to hurt them. Okay, so they're saying it's okay to hurt, but most of them are also saying it's not okay to harm. So that where they are drawing this weird moving line between hurt and harm, and, and most people would say, you know, certainly, you know, I, I reserve the right to spank my children, but, you know, if if, if the child has to go to hospital because its parents have beaten it, no one accepts that. That's terrible. That's child abuse, okay? So, so, so there's this kind of intuitive sense that the, these kinds of things are harm. So is, is, is the red mark too much? Is the bruise too much? Is the bleeding too much? Is the broken bones that, where the line happens? That, you know, there, there's this kind of sliding definition there. Of, of acceptable hurt versus abuse of harm. Um, and that's exactly where this controversy lies, is, 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 is where do we draw that line? Um, and the problem, of course, is that these ideas are based on tradition. They're based on, uh, on, on like, you know, people learning stuff from their parents. And very often the way people parent is the way they were parented. There's a real risk of simply creating a kind of social reproductions, creating cycles of repetition across generations. But also, these things have changed. It's almost certain that your ideas of corporal punishment are fundamentally different from your grandparents. Um, and we need to understand how that happened. Um, but the, the issue being that, that ideas about corporal punishment are often very passionately believed and, and sometimes are upheld um, using religious claims. And of course, religious claims are often the most difficult to contest using research and science and professional expertise, because they rely on a totally different kind of authority. Um, but those, but, but those um, traditional um, belief claims tend to be very powerful, and they tend to be emotionally held, and they're often quite resistant to simple um, uh, contradiction from, from, from research. So. Um, we need to think more deeply, the more deeply about the way research and expertise impact on, on, on culture and society. And if, we, and if we do follow this very well-established body of research, 
saying that in fact these acts do constitute a form of violence. Um, they do constitute very identifiable risks of harm. Um, and we do need to do something about them. But there's kind of resistance to simply legislating. There's not only resistance from the vocal kind of extremist minorities in the public amongst traditionalists and fundamentalists. There's also resistance from politicians who are very careful to sort of see which way the wind of public opinion is blowing because what they really care about is election rather than other public goods. Um, so it leaves us with a really interesting question. Firstly, to work out where do our own ideas and beliefs about corporal punishment come from? How did these fit with the forms of expertise um, and, um, and, and the research-based findings? Um, and how do we negotiate that? And if we, do, if we do agree on a set of guidelines, things like the United Nations um, uh, Rights of the Child or the recommendations of the National Commission of, on Violence, then what do we do? What do we do to try and to bring about legal change, social consensus, change in the social norms and behavior to protect this particularly very vulnerable group? against um, acts of violence that have been normalized um, historically and are actually now very, very difficult to dislodge because of that.